Hello, my name is Max Kells. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and critical care and the director of the Neural Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd like to thank the AUA Organizing Committee for inviting me to speak on this presidential panel. I'm going to tell you today about work from my own lab, as well as that of many others, that highlights several intriguing observations. Namely, that the neuronal mechanisms regulating sleep and anesthetic hypnosis converge in the mammalian hypothalamus. Over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to briefly review the CNS sites whose activity is known to modulate arousal. I'll focus on the evidence for sleep-promoting neurons in the hypothalamus. I'll make the case that mechanistically distinct general anesthetics convergently depolarize ensembles of sleep-promoting pre-optic and supraoptic area neurons. I'll tell you that reactivation of anesthetic active pre-optic and supraoptic neurons in the absence of anesthetic drugs is sufficient to promote endogenous non-REM sleep. And finally, I'll tell you that modulation of sleep and anesthetic activated neurons influences the stability of the anesthetic state itself. For those of you new to the neurobiology of arousal state regulation, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight that multiple sites across the entire neuroaxis can regulate arousal. In this talk, however, I'm going to focus in only on the hypothalamus. As we hopefully approach the end of this COVID pandemic that has prevented us from meeting in person, I'm going to hearken back to one of the last major pandemics to sweep across the globe. In 1916, Baron Konstantin von Economo began to see patients with a new type of encephalitis that specifically attacked regions of the brain regulating sleep and wakefulness. This disorder was eventually called encephalitis lethargica or sleeping sickness. It swept across Europe and North America. By the end of the 1930s, the disease disappeared. Although the infectious agent was never identified, von Economo was able to identify regions of the human brain in which damage altered the regulation of sleep and wakefulness. In affected individuals suffering from insomnia, neuropathologic examination revealed extensive damage to the anterior hypothalamus. Von Economo also noticed that individuals suffering from hypersomnolence or excessive sleepiness exhibited extensive damage to the posterior hypothalamus shown here in red. These observations led von Economo to speculate that sleep promoting structures would be found in the anterior hypothalamus and wake promoting structures or neuronal function could be localized in the posterior hypothalamus. Von Economo's hypotheses about sleep and wake promoting functions in the hypothalamus have been repeatedly verified over the ensuing decades. Shown here is a study by John and Kumar in which neurotoxic lesions were made that destroyed medial preoptic neurons, and that caused insomnia in rats. However, I could have easily chosen from dozens of other surgical, electrolytic, or neurotoxic lesions to validate von Economo's hypotheses in cats, rats, mice, as well as humans. A major advance in our understanding of the neurobiology of sleep and wakefulness occurred in the late 1990s with the discovery that sleep was actively generated. Shown here is work from Sharon and colleagues. They identified a specific cluster of neurons in the ventrolateral pre-optic hypothalamus that showed enhanced expression of the CFOS protein during non-REM sleep. CFOS has been used for decades as a marker of antecedent neuronal activity. Sharon and colleagues found that these neurons in VILPO, which send inhibitory projections to wake-promoting tubal mammillary nucleus, or TMN neurons shown above, specifically increased their firing as evidenced by CFOS. This speculation of increased neural activity was confirmed by Gallopin and colleagues in ex vivo recordings prepared through preoptic 
anterior hypothalamic slices. Gallupin found that bath application of wake-promoting neurotransmitters, such as norepinephrine or increasing acetylcholine, or in certain instances, serotonin, could transiently disrupt pacemaking activity of these putative sleep-active vilponeurons. These ex vivo recordings in SLICE were confirmed by Smuziak and colleagues using microwire recordings in which uh, electrical activity in intact behaving rats was studied. As predicted by Sharon and by Gallopin, specific neurons that fired more frequently with the onset of non-REM sleep were localized to the ventral most regions of the preoptic anterior hypothalamus. Liu and Saper used lesions of Vilpo to demonstrate that with bilateral destruction of Vilpo, insomnia ensues in rats. Using more sophisticated neurophysiologic techniques, Xinjie Chung and Franz Weber, working in Yang Dan's lab, expressed channel rhodopsins in the preoptic area in GABAergic neurons that send projections to the TMN. What Shinjie was able to show was that light-induced excitation of these preoptic area hypothalamic neurons was sufficient to induce a state of non-REM sleep. Conversely, light-induced inhibition of activity of the same TMN projecting Vilpo and other preoptic area neurons was sufficient to rouse sleeping animals. And that's shown in aggregate here. To this point, preoptic area hypothalamic neurons show state-dependent firing patterns with subsets of neurons displaying higher levels of spiking during non-REM sleep. Increased non-REM sleep firing rates are mirrored by CFOS protein induction. Modulation of these sleep-active neurons is sufficient to affect the stability of states of sleep and wake in the intact animal. Next, I'm going to make the case that general anesthetics activate subsets of these sleep-active preoptic area neurons. Jun Liu and Cliff Saper, together with Mervyn Mays and Nick Franks, had previously demonstrated systemic delivery of propofol, pentobarbital, chloral hydrate, and dexmedetomidine, but interestingly enough, not of ketamine, all induce CFOS expression in Vilpo, consistent with an anesthetic-induced recruitment of these sleep-active Vilpo neurons. My group exposed mice to hypnotic doses of volatile anesthetics and similarly demonstrated an induction of CFOS occurs in Vilpo in dose-dependent fashion. Under wakeful conditions, there's a low level of CFOS immunoreactivity shown by the brown dots, which dose dependently increases up through hypnotic doses of isoflurane. A similar equipotent dose of havothane also induced near maximal levels of CFOS in Vilpo. This activity of Vilpo was no different in anesthetized animals versus those naturally sleeping during the rest period. And the superposition of anesthesia during the rest period led to a ceiling effect, arguing perhaps that anesthetics were working on the very same neurons that are induced by sleep as evidenced by a lack of additivity. Preparing slices through the hypothalamus that captured Vilpo, we went on to show that the induction by CFOS was mirrored electrophysiologically. So isoflurane dose dependently increased depolarization and firing rates of Vilpo neurons. This action occurred in the setting of blockers of GABA and glutamate signaling, and also occurred under conditions of synaptic isolation. Cumulatively, our work suggests that Vilpo neurons could be directly depolarized by volatile anesthetics. In the intervening years, we've learned more about the identity of these 
anesthetic active Villepin neurons. We know that they are GABAergic and galaninergic, but work from Giancarlo Vanini and George Mishur at Michigan reminds us to be cautious in our interpretation. Vanini and colleagues demonstrated that chemogenetic excitation of GABAergic preoptic area neurons and glutamatergic area neurons in the median preoptic area, as well as in the ventrolateral preoptic area, could under certain conditions affect the regulation of sleep and wakefulness. But under no condition was preoptic area excitation sufficient to alter the onset or dissipation of isoflurane anesthesia. Vanini's work argues either for a potential dissociation between sleep and anesthetic active neurons, or the interpretation which I favor, that nonspecific cell type markers are not sufficient to uniquely identify sleep and anesthetic active cohorts of neurons. In support of this latter interpretation is work done by Franks and Wisden returned to the question of dexmedetomidine induced activation of neurons across the preoptic hypothalamus. They showed that dexmedetomidine could induce CFOS expression in Vilpo, lateral preoptic and medial preoptic areas of the hypothalamus, as well as in the septum, and that levels of FOS expression that followed dexmedetomidine were similar to those induced by recovery sleep. Using a clever genetic strategy to trap and tag neurons that were previously active under dexmedetomidine, Zhang and colleagues could label dexmedetomidine-induced neurons and express a chemogenetic excitatory sequence under these dexmedetomidine active neurons. They showed that expression was durable, lasting days, non-REM deep recovery sleep was qualitatively similar and showed significant overlap with that of dexmedetomidine induction. Remarkably, reactivation of dexmedetomidine induced neurons was shown to be sufficient to increase non-REM sleep. And that occurred when reactivated neurons were excited either in medial or lateral portions of preoptic hypothalamus. Up until now, I demonstrated that neurons in the preoptic hypothalamus are anesthetic active and sleep active. I next want to transition to tell you about work coming out of Fen Wang's lab that argues supraoptic area neurons are also anesthetic active. Fen Wang looked more caudally and demonstrated that isoflurane could induce CFOS expression in supraoptic and perisupraoptic area neurons shown here in green and highlighted by the white arrows. Showing concordance between uh, immunohistochemistry and in vivo physiology, Wang's group did microwire recordings. They demonstrated that while the majority of neurons in the supraoptic area were indeed inhibited by isoflurane, a specific subset shown in red showed increased firing and increased activity in response to isoflurane exposure. Using yet another clever genetic strategy developed by Fan Wang, the group deployed a technique called CANE, which stands for Capture of Activated Neuronal Ensembles. Histologic labeling of cane neurons that were activated by isoflurane exposure is shown in red here. At a subsequent point in time, re-exposure of cane labeled neurons to the isoflurane anesthetic induced acute CFOS immunoreactivity with a high degree of concordance. When slices were prepared from cane labeled neurons, Wang and colleagues demonstrated that isoflurane depolarized these cane-labeled neurons as expected. Remarkably, supraoptic area neurons that were labeled by isoflurane with the cane technique were subsequently shown to be depolarized not only by isoflurane, but by propofol, both histologically as well as electrophysiologically, by ketamine with xylazine, histologically, <clears throat> 
as well as electrophysiologically by exposure to ketamine alone. And finally, by dexmedetomidine exposure, both histologically as well as electrophysiologically. Moving beyond mere correlation of electrical activity and investigating significance, Wang and colleagues show that chemogenetic activation of supraoptic area neurons was sufficient to induce sleep. Chemogenetic excitatory sequences could be depolarized as expected by delivery of CNO. And that in comparison to saline shown on the left, chemogenetic reactivation of supraoptic area isoflurane activated neurons was sufficient to induce sleep, both in the individual shown here, as well as in aggregate across a population shown by these bar graphs. Increased slow wave or non-REM sleep triggered by chemogenetic reactivation of supraoptic area uh, isoflurane induced neurons came at the expense of wakefulness and was due to an increased bout duration of non-REM sleep. Finally, showing the significance of supraoptic area inhibition on anesthetic states, Fan Wang's group optogenetically inhibited these supraoptic area labeled neurons. They showed that the optogenetic inhibition had significant impact on the ensuing anesthetic state. While induction of anesthesia was no different whether they inhibited supraoptic area neurons in arch expressing neurons or transfected controls, the duration of anesthesia was foreshortened by inhibiting these anesthetic area neurons. So in summary, what I told you is that hypothalamic neurons regulate sleep and anesthetic hypnosis. In the case of VILPO and other preoptic area neurons, sleep-promoting VILPO neurons can be depolarized by barbiturates, propofol, isoflurane, sevoflurane, halothane, dexmedetomidine, and chloral hydrate, but not by the anesthetic ketamine. Conversely, in the supraoptic area, sleep-promoting neurons are depolarized by all tested anesthetics, including ketamine. Recruitment of anesthetic active and sleep-promoting neurons has physiologic and mechanistic significance, both for endogenous sleep as well as for states of anesthesia. And lastly, key circuit differences that distinguish endogenous sleep from drug-induced anesthetic hypnosis remain an active area of investigation. With that, I'll stop. I'll thank the members of the Neural Lab Group, and I look forward to your questions in the discussion section.